Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here on this Monday, start of a new week. Hope you're having a good day wherever you are in this world. We're going to get started on part two of this deep dive into the Scott Peterson case, an old one, 20 years now, over 20 years. But you realize how much you forget when you start diving back in to this stuff all these years later. You remember the framework, but not the details. It's kind of like my mind's been blown all day going back through this stuff. But first, you know the drill. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Music fact of the day, the song Fix You by Coldplay. Amazing lyrics, y'all. Love it. Makes me cry every time I hear it. Chris Martin explained to Howard Stern that Fix You is about fixing his band. They were going through a hard time, struggling with addiction. There was also fighting within the band, and their manager, Phil Harvey, had taken time off due to health issues. Chris Martin told Howard Stern the band just felt screwed. Also, Gwyneth Paltrow said the song was Chris's attempt to put her back together after her dad died. One thing that's crazy to think about is baby Connor would be 21 years old had he not been killed. After I did the first episode, I had a lot of people inbox me, email me, get in touch and say, you need to watch The Murder of Lacey Peterson on A&E. It's an interesting documentary. It's four or five parts. I'm going to link that documentary in the description. You can watch it on YouTube. It tells both sides of the story. There are interviews with Scott's family. And then you have law enforcement from both sides who feel Scott was the one who did it. And then others point out things that weren't followed up on. Now, do I think Scott killed Lacey by all means at this point? Yes, I followed the trial. It was a long one, but I walked away feeling if I was on that jury and found him guilty, I made the right call. Due to the fact that the reason we're even talking about Scott Peterson in 2024 is obviously this new push to get him a new trial. What I'm going to do is I am going to inject some of these opposing views every now and then during this series just because these are things that are going to come up over the course of these hearings that are set for the next few months and that the judge will have to decide, do these things along with the DNA that they want to have tested equal a new trial for Scott? I'm not convinced he'll get one, but you never know. Ted Rollins from Court TV is on there. He was one of the first on the case. He points out things that weren't looked into, and so we're going to get to that. I highly recommend you guys check out this documentary. What are some things I've learned while researching this case? If you look at Scott, he was a serial cheater. He cheated on Lacey shortly after they were married, and then we know with Amber... But also, there was a girlfriend that dated him before. And the one common theme that all of these women have said is that ultimately, Scott was just this Prince Charming. And that seemed to be a very common theme among these women, just perfect, couldn't find fault with him. He just showered them with gifts, compliments. One thing that stands out to me, too, is how brazen Scott was with his affairs. It's not like they were just in hotels secluded away. He was going to parties. He was going to social functions. He was being introduced as the boyfriend and never seemed to care if anybody he or Lacey knew happened to stumble upon him out on the town with another woman while he's married. And then you wonder, why does somebody like Scott even get married? My theory for motive in this whole time, and it's just my two cents, is that ultimately Scott didn't want to be a dad. I don't think he intended on marrying Amber. I just think that Scott didn't want the responsibility. And if you have kids, it is a minimum of 18 years and really the rest of your life because they never stop being your babies, right? They also cost a lot of money. Scott was living beyond his means from what we've heard. I just feel like that was the motive. That due date was quickly approaching. I don't know. What do you guys think? was the motive. Let me know in the comments. I may not always get to respond to all of them, but I do read them. And you guys are amazing. Y'all have some good thoughts. You get my gears turning a lot. So what has happened with their parents? Sadly, Lacey's dads and Connor's grandpas, Ron Gransky and Dennis Rocha, both passed away the same year. Ron passed away in April of 2018. 
and her biological father, Dennis Rocha, passed away December of 2018. By all means, that they all loved Lacey and, and parented her as a unit. What has Sharon been doing? since all of this wrapped up and life goes on. She wrote a book. It's called For Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss, and Justice. I'm actually about to start that book. I'm currently reading Amber Frey's book. It's called Witness. Very good read. Highly recommend it. Aside from being an author, she helped launch Lacey and Connor's Law. This law makes it a crime to harm a fetus by attacking the mother. It recognizes the fetus as a legal victim if they are injured or killed during the commission of a crime of violence. If you're on YouTube, you can see a photo here. She is there in the White House back in 2004, and that is when George Bush signed that into law. Scott's mom, Jackie, passed away in 2013. His father is still alive and he's 84 now. I made a slideshow that just has a lot of random pictures of the search, Lacey at various stages in her life, wedding photos, all kinds of things. I found a lot of the evidence that was entered into trial. So I've been pulling from that. I'm just going to let that play in the background while we go through this episode. How did Lacey and Scott meet? They met in college at Cal Poly. They married in 1997. He and Lacey lived apart the first part of their marriage. Scott had three roommates while he finished school. While Scott was still in college and married, he had an affair. This was early on in that marriage. He met a woman named Janet. Well, like he did with Amber, he told Janet he wasn't married. And on their first date, he brought her 12 bouquets of roses with a dozen roses in each one. He wined and dined her. He bought expensive gifts, and he would often bring his dog Mackenzie on dates with them. Remember, Lacey bought Mackenzie for Scott for Christmas one year. Janet found out he was married after she tried to sneak in bed with him, only to find his wife Lacey was in the bed as well. Lacey obviously found out about the affair and forgave Scott. She went on to say that on their first date, it was at a rodeo. Scott was very clear and told her he did not want children. He thought they would interfere with his lifestyle. What about Lacey? In college, she was a horticulture major. She loved planting. And her mom, Sharon, said Lacey just loved being in the dirt, in the weeds, in the grass. And Lacey's goal was to open her own flower shop. After Scott graduated, he bought his father's business and then turned around and sold it. He and Lacey opened up a sports bar. The name of it was The Shack. And it didn't do well, so they closed it down and moved to Modesto. They bought their home there in 2002. Scott sold fertilizer across New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And Lacey got a job as a substitute teacher. One thing that's interesting is Scott told anybody who would listen that he was not super excited about being a father. He and Lacey actually had considered fertility treatments, but she ended up conceiving Connor in 2002. Scott told his sister-in-law, Rose Marie, he had hoped they were not fertile. Let's go back to December 24th. When Scott was leaving the marina, he left a voicemail for Lacey. It said, hey, beautiful, I just left a message at home. It's 2.15, I'm leaving Berkeley. I won't be able to get to Vela Farms to get that basket for Papa. I was hoping you could get this message and go on out there. I'll see you in a bit, sweetie. Love you, bye. In the police video, if you remember, he did agree to take a polygraph test, but... His dad told him not to because if he passed, nobody would hear about it, but it would be on the news if he failed it. The police were getting questions from the media about this, and investigators told Scott that they were going to make a statement to the media. And they wouldn't say that he's been totally uncooperative, but they're going to say he hasn't been completely cooperative. Detective John Bueller said a few things that first night Lacey went missing really stood out to him. One thing was a detective was given a glass of water while they were inside the home with Scott's consent. The detective sat the water down on the counter and Scott was right behind him with a coaster. Also, when they were going through Scott and Lacey's cars, they were parked pretty close. And so when the door was open, there was a chance it was going to touch the other car and chip the paint. Scott was standing there with a glove so that the paint would not get nicked. Detective Bueller just thought things like that would not be important in that moment if your wife and unborn son were missing. Scott sister-in-law Janie said on the a &E documentary that there were leaks to the media that the house smelled of bleach that first night. She said that turned out not to be true 
And in fact, she said every responding officer to the house that night, Lacey went missing, was asked if the house smelled like bleach, and they said no. There was also no physical evidence found in the home that would suggest a crime had occurred there. At the warehouse, the one piece of physical evidence they found was a single hair on a pair of rusted pliers. That hair belonged to Lacey. This case was largely circumstantial, really, if you think about it. But Alec Murdoch was just convicted last year on a circumstantial case. Sometimes you don't need all the forensics to prove your case to a jury. Now, Lacey's family initially defended and stood by Scott in the media. They would make pleas for any abductors to let Lacey go. On Christmas Day, when Scott went in for the interview at the police station, one investigator said he was expecting Scott to ask what they were doing to find Lacey, but he didn't. He seemed uninterested. Scott told the investigator that fishing was a last minute decision the morning Lacey disappeared. He talks about Lacey was going to the store. She was going to prep for Christmas breakfast and make gingerbread cookies that night. The investigator asked about the mop and the bucket and what Lacey was mopping. Scott said probably the entryway tile. The investigator asked at the front door or the entryway into that converted garage area. Scott says, well, not the front door, but the back door that we came in, meaning him and the investigators. Scott said Lacey asked him to put that bucket by the front door. Scott said he left around 930 that morning and then went to his shop. He said he assembled his mortiser, which is a woodworking tool to make tables. Essentially, they drill holes in wood. He also checked his email. He sent an email. He hooked up the boat and headed to the marina. He said he drove straight there. When he got to the marina, he stayed on the water for about an hour and a half. He said he didn't have a map of the area, but he went a couple of miles north and found a little island that had a bunch of trash in it with a sign that said no landing. He also said the area had broken piers around it. He went back to the landing to leave, and he said some maintenance guys had a laugh at him trying to back the trailer in, and a couple of guys were talking about fishing. It should be noted these people were never found, obviously never testified at the trial either. Once he got home, he saw their dog with the leash still on, so he took the leash off and put it on the picnic table. He said he went inside through the back door. He took towels out of the washer and put in his jeans his t-shirt, and the green pullover that he had been wearing that day. He said he assumes their cleaning lady used the towels to clean. He didn't know what surfaces the cleaning lady had cleaned with those towels. He said he added soap, started the washer. He said he was calling for Lacey, but she wasn't home, and so he just assumed that she was at her mom's. He got pizza from the fridge and poured a small glass of milk. He said he took the pizza into the bathroom and started the shower. He called Lacey's mom, Sharon, after he got out of the shower. They hadn't heard from her, and he said it wasn't unusual for them not to hear from her all day. They were supposed to be at Lacey's mom's between 6 and 6.30 for Christmas Eve dinner. In addition to calling Sharon, Scott called a couple of Lacey's close friends. He said he had the phone book out to call hospitals, but Lacey's mom said they would do that, and also they would call the police. She told him to check with neighbors and then go to the park. He said the only unusual thing he noticed at home was that the dog still had the leash on and the door was unlocked. In the police interview, Scott said he and Lacey had no marital problems, and at that point, they had been married for four years. The investigator mentioned Scott said the few times he had been to the park, he had seen transients in the area. Lacey never mentioned anybody bothering her in the park, but he said at times she felt uncomfortable and she was glad she had the dog. He said the dog was very protective of her. He said they called the police a couple of times to have them move the transients along. And he said it wasn't uncommon for him or Lacey to wake these people up and tell them to get lost. The investigator points out that the cleaning lady was there on Monday, so why was Lacey mopping on a Tuesday? Scott said Lacey was very particular because of the dogs and the cats. The investigator said at this point, they would let volunteers hand out flyers. They would also use the media to get the word out far and wide to see if they could get any tips. What's weird is in the police interview, Scott asked the investigator about getting counseling for Sharon and some of Lacey's closest friends. The investigator tells Scott it's Christmas and nothing's going to be done about that right now, which is very odd. Why would you even be thinking about counseling? But then Scott says they wouldn't need it if they found Lacey in the next few days. The investigator asked Scott where he wanted to go after the interview, and Scott says, back to my home. One thing pretty much everybody picked up on is how Scott seemed totally unbothered in the days after Lacey disappeared. 
I don't think I ever heard him express concern for Connor at all in anything I've watched. This is not the demeanor of somebody who is missing his wife, who is due to give birth to his son in just a couple of months. I know people say some people don't show stress the way you and I do, but still very odd to me. In a press conference, Sharon pleads for Lacey's safe return and says that Lacey and Scott have the kind of relationship that people are envious of. And the two of them were very much in love. She said they were perfect together and they were looking forward to the birth of Connor. Scott's sister said that they thought maybe Lacey had fallen or gotten into a place she couldn't get out of or that somebody had taken her. On December 26th, a volunteer command post was established at a local hotel. They worked on flyers, buttons, and coordinating canvases. They searched areas and they also received tips. A lot of the tips in the first few days were about sightings of Lacey that ultimately, as we know, never panned out. Well, what's odd is there's a photo that was actually entered in as evidence into the trial at that volunteer command post. It was a large piece of paper that was written by Scott. It said, volunteers, as I see every person come through this door or out searching, I tell Lacey about them looking for her. Early this morning, I felt she could hear me. She thanks you. Lacey's husband. December 26, two days missing. Scott's sister was at Scott and Lacey's house and she was getting ready to cook dinner. Officers came in and informed her they had a search warrant and they would be there probably throughout the night. Detective John Bueller explained on the documentary on A&E that the search warrant partially was to gauge Scott and his demeanor. He said Scott did not give permission that night. Why not, if you have nothing to hide? Scott's sister said that Scott let them in on the 24th, and he was hesitant to agree on the 26th because he didn't know what he was signing if he gave consent. She said his attorney did not respond in time, so at that point, the investigators came in with the search warrant. After that search warrant, the story really started gaining traction in the media. Some neighbors couldn't even stay in their homes because of the bright lights, satellite trucks. Reporters were going live all hours of the night. December 27th, around this time, Scott retains attorney Kirk McAllister. Now, McAllister hires a PI named Gary to try to find out what happened to Lacey. Lacey's mom and brother went live to plead for her safe return. Her brother says, whoever has her, please have some compassion. She's a wife, daughter, sister, and she's pregnant. She needs to take care of her baby. There was also a press conference this day. At this press conference, her dad, Ron, broke down and literally could not stand upright. I mean, he bent over and just sobbed. Gloria Gomez, the local journalist, said that was really the kind of reaction they expected from Scott. Ted Rollins recounts talking to Scott. Scott didn't want the cameras involved, and that was odd because usually you want the media's attention. Scott's brother-in-law, his sister's husband, his name is Ed, he said it was a lose-lose situation for Scott in the media. He said if Scott breaks down, people will say he's not strong enough. And if he doesn't, people will say he just doesn't care. And Nancy Grace was also on this Annie documentary. I totally remember her coverage of Lacey. She was on Larry King Live frequently about this and sometimes sat in for him. She says Scott just didn't seem genuine and came off as very cocky to her. Scott's brother-in-law said his fear was that the media would latch on to one thing with Scott and ask, what's going on? Scott's sister said that Scott was coming up with strategies for searching for Lacey. His brother-in-law also said that Scott saw the media was starting to turn things towards him. Lacey's family was still defending him at a presser. She was disappointed with the media pointing to Scott and said the focus needs to be on finding Lacey. At another presser, Sharon said that the family felt Scott had nothing to do with her disappearance. Scott's dad did an interview and said that Scott is kind and gentle and the kind of guy that would pull over on the freeway if he had a flat tire. Scott's dad and sister talk about meeting Lacey for the first time. His dad said he had never seen Scott happier. Scott's sister said in the beginning they weren't going to have kids. She said by the next year, they were trying to have a baby. They show a video of Scott holding a baby, and he says it's not much fun. Scott's dad remembers the phone call from Lacey telling them that she was pregnant. Scott's brother-in-law says Scott couldn't wait for the baby to come. Scott told his dad they were having a nautical theme for the baby's room, so Scott's dad went and bought this life preserver that says, Welcome aboard. 
And he said Lacey loved that. On December 28th, the Berkeley Marina, where Scott went fishing, is searched for the first time. About six days after Lacey's disappearance, the Modesto PD have a press conference to talk about the burglary that happened across the street from the Peterson home, which could have been a potential break in the case at the time. Initially, they said that this happened on December 24th in the morning around the time Lacey went missing. A witness who lived in the area drove by and saw a suspicious vehicle and suspicious people in front of the house at around 11 40 a.m the lady said she rode by saw a van and people standing on the lawn and what stood out to her is they all turned around and looked at her as she passed by she didn't put two and two together until later on when the homeowners returned home and found they had been robbed. The witness said it clicked that she saw the van on the 24th which was the same day Lacey disappeared. She walked outside because there were police around, and so she told them what she saw that morning. Even Lacey's family thought there could be a connection there. And after news of that got out, Lacey's brother Brent was interviewed at the volunteer headquarters, and he said that the burglary was his main focus, and he thinks there could be something there. He said, what are the odds of two crimes occurring within the same time frame directly across the street from each other on the same day? The bulletin put out by police said that the suspects were three men in an older model full-size van that was light or tan in color, and it had rear opening doors. Among the items stolen from the house was a Tex 9mm semi-automatic handgun, a Beretta 380 handgun, a drill, a tool kit, a Canon camera, a Gucci watch, a Louis Vuitton purse, a safe, numerous pieces of jewelry, including large carrots, rubies, and diamonds. Scott's mom talked to the media and said, if these robbers made a mistake, they can change it by letting Lacey go. Scott's sister said Lacey was the type of person, if she saw something like that, she would have put her nose in it. The private investigator Scott's attorney hired talked to a lot of people over the course of a couple of weeks. He talked to witnesses who were able to, as he says, credibly identify Lacey as walking the dog in the time frame Scott would have been at the warehouse or on his way to the marina. One couple interviewed on this documentary are neighbors, and they said between 9.50 a.m. and 10, they left to deliver Christmas presents to a friend when they noticed a young lady struggling with her dog, and she was very pregnant. The dog kind of raised up, and the woman told her husband that she hoped the lady didn't fall down. He talked to a driver for a bread company who also saw a pregnant woman walking a golden retriever on La Loma Avenue. Now at 10.08, Scott calls his voicemail, which verified that he was on his way to the warehouse at the time these people say they saw Lacey. Another witness said he was with his wife. They see a lady, again, on La Loma Avenue. He said she looked too pregnant to be out in the cold with no jacket on. And he told his wife that poor lady must be crazy. The private investigator said they had more witnesses seeing Lacey walking her dog. The different witnesses put her walking in a circle in what would have been her normal 45-minute walk. There was also a woman working at a hospital who was out back having a cigarette. She claims she saw Lacey across a creek and said a woman matching Lacey's description walking a dog. Two men were following her, and the dog was barking at the men. One of the men yelled to shut the dog up. A man named Homer was interviewed on the A&E special and said when police said they interviewed everyone, he said in his own words, it's a bunch of crap because they never came to talk to him and his wife about anything. Another man said on the day after Christmas, he talked to an officer on a motorcycle and gave him a statement of what he saw, but it was never followed up on. Ted Rollins said if any one of those people who claimed to have saw Lacey walking her dog and actually did see her walking the dog, that would mean Scott Peterson is innocent because at 10.30, Scott was on his computer to the warehouse. One thing to note, in the trial, they had pictures of different women who looked very similar to Lacey that walked their dogs in the morning. And I think it would be easy to discredit these witnesses because um, I don't want to share their photos on here because I'm just trying to respect their privacy. But a lot of them did look similar to Lacey and were very pregnant and had dogs that looked to be a similar color. So that theory for me doesn't 
change my mind very much. I can link those photos in the description because they are public. I just don't want to put them on here. Richard Cole, who is a journalist with Redwood City Daily News, said if Scott killed Lacey, it would have meant he would have had her body in the parking lot of that warehouse where Scott would go back inside, get on his computer and send Christmas greetings to his boss, then go to a website that showed how to assemble that woodworking tool he had just had delivered. He said to think someone would believe anyone would do this is just unimaginably crazy. Ed Steele, a former sergeant with the Modesto PD, he was assigned to be Scott's personal security and kind of confidant and also his middleman to investigators. He said when he first met Scott, he thought he was very charming. But he remembers one instance where he went to the volunteer center one day and Scott was already there. He was eating ribs that was provided by a local business. When Ed walks in, Scott stands up and yells to Ed, hey, come over here. Check this out. Scott holds up a big rack of ribs still dripping with barbecue sauce. It just struck Ed as odd about how excited Scott was about some ribs. Before we get into the wiretaps on the next episode, just going to give you a little bit of backstory on her. Amber just graduated from massage school and had an 18-month-old daughter. She was living in Fresno, California. That's about an hour and a half away from Modesto. Maybe that was where Scott found his comfort zone, that it was far enough away that he could go out with her. Still very weird. Five weeks before Lacey's disappearance, Amber's friend Sean told her she had met somebody at a work convention and she thought this guy would be perfect for her none other than Scott Peterson. At this point in Amber's life, she really wasn't interested in dating around. She was looking for the one. Scott had told her friend that's exactly what he was looking for. Amber had no idea he was married, and I always felt so bad for Amber because even though she had the courage to get up at that press conference, tell her story, a lot of people really attacked her. This was sort of in the early days of the internet, but I do remember a lot of backlash against Amber. And I'm going to tell you, when we go through these wiretaps, Amber did such a solid job of baiting Scott, trying to get anything out of him that would help find Lacey. I have total respect for her. Her book's a great read. Go get it. She said things took off very quickly. She had a big Christmas party. She asked Scott to be a part of it. She said Scott was excited to be a part of it and also to be her date. She felt their relationship was moving forward really well, and she was excited. When Scott told her he needed to talk to her about something, that he lied to her, he had been married, and he had lost his wife, and this would be the first holidays without her. Now, get this, that was early in December, way before Lacey ever went missing. She said it seemed really hard for him, so she just didn't push for answers. When Scott told her he would be out of town in December into January. He said he was going to Europe, but said they would talk more about their relationship once he returned from his little fake trip. Once Lacey had disappeared, Amber said she really wasn't watching news or anything that would have alerted her to Lacey being missing. And at this point, she still didn't know Scott was married and expecting a child. She said life was just going on as usual for her. Investigators asked Amber if she would be willing to cooperate, and she said there wasn't any reason for her not to. By the way, she is also on this a &E documentary. They went to Radio Shack and bought a device that attached to her phone, which connected to a tape recorder to start recording these calls with Scott. Before Amber and the police left Radio Shack, Scott called. She was so nervous, but she took the call. She said she was fumbling, the connection wasn't good, and the call dropped. Detective Bueller reassured her that Scott doesn't know they were recording the calls and said when he calls back, just be calm and carry on as you normally do with him. So over the course of a month, from January into the beginning of February, Amber recorded calls with Scott. Detective Bueller said they ended up with about 29 hours of recorded conversations. They did not want to tell anybody, Scott's family, Lacey's family, especially the media, about Amber because they wanted to see what she could get out of him. The goal was to keep the conversations going as long as possible. On the A&E special, they released a call with Scott from 2004. He was talking to his dad, Lee, and his dad asked, why did he talk to Amber after Lacey went missing? Scott said the overriding reason was that she starts to do media interviews and then there would be no more search for Lacey and Connor. He said he learned with the Chandra Levy investigation that once it was revealed Gary Condent had an affair with her, there was no more searching for her. He said every hour he could keep the search going for Lacey, 
this is all solved if he could bring Lacey and Connor home. We're going to get into those calls tomorrow, but I'm going to give you a spoiler. A lot of these calls are, can you hear me? Hello? Amber? Scott? It's a lot of that back and forth. Now, in her book, Witness, she talks about meeting Scott on their first date at a place called the Elephant Bar in Fresno, California. This was a blind date set up by her friend, Sean, again, who met Scott at a convention in Anaheim. Sean was in a relationship already, but suggested to Amber that maybe she wants to meet Scott. So she called Amber and asked if she could give Scott her number. Sean told her that Scott was handsome and nice and that Scott was looking for someone who was interested in a committed relationship. She said it took a few weeks for Scott to call, but he impressed her right off the bat. On the next episode, we are going to dig deeper into their relationship some of the wiretaps, talk about that first date. You forget how crazy this case was. And I'm going to say I have so much respect for Amber because I don't know how at times she just did not tell him off on these wiretap calls or just laugh in his face as he is blatantly lying about being in Europe and she knows he's in Modesto, right? Amber just wanted to help. And it was clear. Amber felt terrible once she learned the truth. I really hope that she has found peace in her life and has been able to have a very happy life. She deserves it for sure. All right, guys, that's it for today. Hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you soon.